Hello YouTube, welcome back to Patrick Boyle on Finance. So I put up a video yesterday on the topic of what does it mean that crude oil has a negative price and it turned out to be the, the by far the biggest video I've ever put up on YouTube and I received a ton of questions in the comments section so I thought I'd try and answer some of those questions today in a new video. And so the big questions were coming in were all about ETFs because that's how an awful lot of people invest in things like oil. You know, they don't buy physical oil, as I explained yesterday. They often don't trade oil futures. What they do is they invest in an ETF like USO. And the idea of that is that it gives an investor exposure to, uh, to crude oil prices. In particular, the, the USO, it stands for US Oil Fund, and it tracks West Texas Intermediate Crude, and in particular, the front month. So what is an ETF, firstly, or an ETP? Uh, yesterday, amusingly, in, in my biggest video ever, I, uh, I erroneously said uh, that it stood for electronically traded fund rather than exchange traded fund. And so I got, got a lot of comments about that. But, um, but anyhow, an exchange traded fund is simply, it's kind of like a mutual fund in that it will hold a basket of securities um, and uh, you often we'll say, for example, it'll hold stocks, right? So you'll have a fund that's made up of a bunch of stocks, usually an index, and uh, you, you can buy and sell the fund through your broker like a single stock. So it basically provides the diversification benefits of a mutual fund with the ease of buying and selling that you get, get trading stocks. You can just buy it and sell it throughout the day. And actually they also can be shorted. And so a lot of hedge funds use uh, ETFs in order to, to short. Uh, not, not necessarily that they're always short, but it's often an easy way of hedging a their position. So if they're long a bunch of oil stocks and they want to hedge their exposure to the oil market, they could short uh, USO, for example. So the fund basically owns whatever the underlying is. Usually it's stocks. In the case of USO, it'll be futures contracts on oil. And then they put together a fund structure um, to, that will track the performance of the underlying assets and they sell shares in that fund to investors. What's going on with USO? Well, the US oil fund uh, fell more than 20% this morning before being halted pending news. And at the time of making this video, it's trading at around $2.40 a share, which means that it's almost halved in a week. So, you know, well, there's big moves in oil and there's big moves in USO. Now, a lot of people asked me, is the reason uh, for, for the super contango that we talked about yesterday, does that relate to USO rolling? And I don't believe that would be true simply because USO uh, in, in their mandate, they actually roll two, two weeks before the futures contracts expire. So they should have rolled well in advance of, uh, of what's going on. Um, but basically one of the things that's happening with USO is that there's been a huge increase in the open interest. And that basically means there's a lot of investors out there, possibly retail investors, who've just seen oil prices fall an awful lot and they want to bet on oil prices going back up. Now I explained yesterday that the problem with making a bet like that using futures is quite simply that futures have these expiration dates, right? So the futures contract that expires at the close of trading today, in fact, by the time I get this video uploaded, it'll probably have expired. But that contract um, is trading at a big discount to the June contract, which will uh, probably by the time you're watching this actually be the front month contract. But what happens is that when markets are in contango like they are right now, you keep sort of uh, having to sell the, the cheap contract and buy the expensive contract. And as I explained yesterday, it's a little bit like paying someone to store oil for another month for you. And at the moment, because there's not much storage capacity, it's very expensive to pay someone to store your oil for you. So the US oil fund actually holds 
between 25 and 30 percent of the open interest in the June contract for West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil. Uh, they saw about 1.5 billion dollars in inflows as retail investors tried to pick the turning point for oil prices. So essentially there's a lot of people who do want to bet on oil prices going up simply because oil prices are quite low and they think well you know maybe they're low because this coronavirus thing but I can buy oil and eventually the price will go up but the problem is of course that they get hammered by this roll of the futures where you keep on having to roll out of the low priced future into the high priced future and then that happens over and over again. Now, that's just when a market is in contango. When it's in backwardation, you actually get what we call a roll yield from rolling the futures. But anyhow, um, a few things have happened within this ETF. So there's been this huge inflow of money, which is actually problematic for them. Um, and they actually changed the structure of the fund on Friday. They, they applied for uh, regulatory approval to change the structure of the fund so that they can hold longer dated contracts. So they're no longer 100% in the front month. And so right now, 80% of the fund can be in the front month contract with 20% in the second month contract. So they're sort of easing, I guess, their impact on, uh, on the role of, uh, of futures. Um, this matters a lot, actually, just because the ETF is huge. Like It's a very uh, large percentage of what's going on in people buying and selling oil, surprisingly enough. And so ETFs um, have to pre-register shares. This is what's going on. This was what was announced when they when they uh, closed the, the market this morning for an announcement. So an ETF actually has to pre-register shares in bulk with market regulators in order to avoid having to go through a registration process every time new shares are issued. So what they usually do is when they launch the fund, they'll pre-register an awful lot of shares, way more than they think they'll need, and, uh, and then they're able to issue them or redeem them as necessary throughout the life of the ETF. But because so many new people have come into the oil market or started buying the US oil ETF, what's happened is that they've run out of pre-registered shares. And so they've applied for approval to, I think, uh, create 4 billion new shares, but they of course have to wait for regulatory approval on that. So we're in a, a funny situation where there's a lot of people who maybe want to buy these shares, but the, the ETF provider is not able to create new shares until it's approved by the regulator. So AUM has exploded, um, but new shares can't be created. So I probably at this point need to explain kind of how ETFs work. So in an ETF structure, you have the ETF sponsor, which is the, the person who came up with the, the, the idea of the ETF, they market the ETF and so on. And then you have what are known as authorized participants, which are a little bit like market makers or something like that. Um, and the, the authorized participants are, are usually investment banks, sometimes brokerage firms who are allowed to deal with the ETF sponsor. So the authorized participants, which are referred to usually as APs, are able to either present a basket of securities and create ETF shares or do the opposite where they can just take a basket of securities and redeem ETF shares. So they are able to create or redeem ETF shares by trading in the underlying security. And so, for example, if you imagine if there's an awful lot of demand for the ETF and the, the ETF price starts to go up more than the, uh, the price of the underlying like crude oil, what they would do is they would issue shares in the ETF and then they would deliver futures um, in order to sort of cover that position. And so, and they would make a profit off of the difference in price between the ETF and the price of the futures that were required to make up those shares. So our authorized participants can buy shares and submit them in exchange for derivatives, or they can sell shares and submit derivatives in, in exchange for them in, in the case of the, the USO ETF. Now, what would happen, there's, I think there's probably about 18 different APs within 
the structure of the USO ETF. So there's a bunch of them. If no AP step in, then what happens? The rules are that the, the ETF trades like a closed end mutual fund and it can basically at that point start trading at either a discount or a premium to the NAV, the net asset value of the, uh, uh, the oil or whatever is supposed to be inside that ETF until an AP steps in and becomes active uh, trading the, the fund and the underlying. And so essentially, uh, you know, an arbitrage could open up for these APs, but they're in a sort of a sticky situation right now where no new shares can be created. So USO right now is not authorized to offer new shares to APs. So shares can be redeemed. So if people were selling an awful lot, you're, the, the APs are able to redeem them, but no new ones can be created. So if the inflows remain constant, if retail investors keep on buying this ETF, even though no new shares can be created, what can happen is that we can see a disconnect in the price between the ETF and its underlying net asset value. And, and basically you would see the USO ETF trading at a higher price than the price of oil, or at least than the oil contracts that, that should be making up the ETF. And so if in the current market environment where we're seeing a huge influx of, of money coming in to actually buy this ETF, I know it sounds surprising, you see the oil price down, um, but there's lots of people investing, but actually you see that a lot with ETFs because there are a lot of investors who like to go counter cyclical. They basically look at it and they say, well, it's down so much, it can only go up from here. And so that might be, uh, you know, the idea amongst a lot of these investors. The ETF, like the USO ETF is essentially overly dominant as it is in its influence on the WTI market. And this, this sort of lack of new shares being available has the impact of reducing the buying pressure on front month WTI futures, because if no new shares have been created, then the APs aren't actually going out and buying the front month futures, right? So the price of the ETF can go up and the futures don't get any real buying pressure on them. And equally, uh, it decreases the selling pressure on the USO ETF, because normally the, the APs would be selling the ETF and buying the futures. They can't do that right now. So that's really the situation right now with, uh, with USO. That's what's going on in the market. Um, I guess one of the takeaways, like I, I don't really want the takeaway of this uh, of my videos just to be sort of a, a CNBC type thing where I just tell you what's happening in the markets because you can you can Google that yourself. Um, what's useful about this information? Well, really, the thing the thing I find interesting here is essentially how do ETFs work and what do you get when you invest in these things? Because an awful lot of the time, like maybe with some simpler ETFs, you really, they're, they're easily understood and you get what you think you're getting. While a lot of people who are probably buying the USO ETF don't really understand that there's futures underlying it. They don't understand the nature of rolling these futures or the nature of things like contango or backwardation in uh, you know commodities markets or in, in derivatives markets. And so in a funny way, um, you know, anyone can trade this thing, but it's worth, if you are an investor, if you're putting your, uh, you know, money at work, trying to build up a retirement account, it's worth really kind of reading into and understanding these things before investing in them, because often they look really simple and you'll read kind of a one line description of it and it'll sound like, well, that's great. I can bet on oil going up and this doesn't expire like futures do, as I explained in yesterday's video. But even though the ETF doesn't expire, the things it invests in do expire, so you end up getting that, at least in this current market environment, that negative uh, roll yield on futures. So that's it for today's video. Uh, do hit the like and subscribe buttons. Um, if you're interested in this kind of finance and derivatives type stuff, uh, take a look at the link in the description below where I have a book on financial derivatives that I linked to. There's also a book on corporate finance that's on Amazon and I have a new one coming out soon on uh, statistics. Anyhow, uh, talk to you guys later. Bye.